Thank you so much, Cecilia. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to give people something to look at. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to talk about four things. The basic motivation for my book, The Deviant Prison, the arc of the book, something I'm really proud of, and what we can learn from Eastern State Penitentiary today. This book started out as my dissertation, and I knew I wanted my dissertation to focus on Eastern State Penitentiary. I wasn't sure if it was going to be one of a few prisons I was going to compare, but I knew I had to do it on Eastern. Eastern is just one of the most fascinating prisons in my opinion. It was one of the first prisons in the United States. I should clarify, it was more like the 20th state prison built in the US, but we now have thousands of prisons. So relatively speaking, it was one of the first. There are also a lot of myths around Eastern that made it sound even more interesting, like how people refer to it as the Quaker prison, which is wrong or stories about how prisoners were blindfolded and referred to by numbers alone. It's also the flagship prison of an unpopul unpopular approach to incarceration. And it's not like it was some unknown prison and that's why this approach never caught on. This unique approach was seriously investigated, studied, considered, and yet very few other states copied it. And even those states eventually rejected it after trying it out for a few years or decades. So there's just a lot that drew me to Eastern. My actual goal for the book was to resolve a very specific puzzle related to Eastern's unique reliance on that frequently rejected approach to incarceration. At a time when almost every other prison followed what was called the Auburn system, Eastern was one of the few prisons and eventually the only prison to use the Pennsylvania system. At the bottom of this slide, I've added maps of the United States in 1821, 1840, and 1860, where states that adopted the Auburn system are represented in blue, and states that adopted the Pennsylvania system are represented in red. You can see that while prisons on the Auburn system continued to spread across the country, the Pennsylvania system became less common over time. This approach relied on long-term solitary confinement for the duration of a prisoner's sentence. Prisoners also received visits from the prison staff as well as from local penal reformers who would instruct the prisoners how to do various kinds of crafts-based work like shoemaking, chairmaking, or weaving. Some of the prison staff and local reformers would also provide what they called moral and religious instruction, essentially instilling white middle-class Protestant Christian values and ideas of morality and religion in the hopes that this would help prisoners choose not to commit crimes in the future. This approach was highly criticized, almost exclusively because of its reliance on solitary confinement, which critics argued was cruel and inhumane, dangerous to prisoners' mental and physical health, too expensive and unprofitable, and ultimately impractical and ineffective. So my central puzzle was why Eastern, essentially alone among US prisons at the time, retained this highly criticized approach to incarceration. As I pursued this question, it actually became even more puzzling because I found how difficult it was to implement the Pennsylvania system, both personally and practically for the men who ran the prison, and also that in practice, they often deviated from it. Basically, they could have saved themselves a lot of heartaches and headaches if they had abandoned their unique approach, and yet they didn't. It was implemented for almost five decades, and then it stayed on the books for another 30 or so years, even though it was no longer in use at that point. Figuring out why the Pennsylvania system was retained at Eastern, despite all those problems and puzzles, is a major focus of the book. I wrote this book as containing three major parts. First, Becoming the Deviant Prison, which explores not only how Eastern's deviance was constructed, but also why the man who ran the prison, sorry, the men who ran the prison, could become so committed to it. Second, the advantage of difference, which looks at how the administrators defended their prison and how that defense ultimately strengthened their commitment to the Pennsylvania system, as well as paying attention to the limits of that commitment. And third, forced to adapt which looks at the twin causes of the Pennsylvania system's decline at Eastern in the 1860s onward. I think of how I organized the book as following an arc. It's not a simple rise and fall story. In fact, there are a few rises and falls in there. Instead, it's more than of tracing Eastern's deviance, becoming deviant, staying deviant, and ending its deviance. The story begins with the failure of the first generation of American prisons. Eastern is a second generation prison, and it comes about because the first-gen prisons were failing so spectacularly. Eastern starts off as this highly anticipated prison, albeit one faced with some trepidation and scrutiny from critics, but for others, it's expected to be a near-perfect prison. And it gains some initial applause, 
But almost immediately after it opens, it starts getting bad press. And we start to see how difficult running the prison really is, both emotionally and practically. Prison administrators worked really hard to defend the system, both publicly and privately, within limits. There are a number of compromises they made to protect the image of the prison. After a few decades of enduring a lot more scrutiny and criticism and repeatedly defending the prison, we start to see the Pennsylvania system decline. Two things happen around the same time. First, penal commentators start to ignore Eastern and its administrators because there are other, more interesting things going on, new penal innovations to concern themselves with, like an early version of parole or new adult reformatory. The second thing is that post-war overcrowding strikes and Eastern runs out of room to house its new prisoners. So solitary confinement is now infeasible. That in itself doesn't kill the Pennsylvania system, but it does create a lot of pressure on how administrators will proceed. So I trace the process by which the Pennsylvania system stops becoming a reality behind the scenes, but also how the administrators slowly distance themselves from it and why. And I explore the decades that follow when the Pennsylvania system is still the legally required approach, but one that is no longer used or discussed. Something that I really like about the book is that each chapter is written in a slightly different style, so it kind of has something for everyone. The first two chapters sweep over, or sorry, the first two chapters are written in a standard historical narrative. The first chapter sweeps over about four decades of developments, basically setting the stage for how Eastern and other second generation prisons came about. The second chapter slows down to focus on about one decade and really zeroes into Pennsylvania to see the creation of the Pennsylvania system and the struggle about what it would look like. The middle chapters proceed more thematically. So the third chapter introduces the men who ran Eastern and the sorts of challenges they faced running a new and unique prison. The fourth chapter describes why people started criticizing the Pennsylvania system and how Eastern's administrators personally experienced that criticism. I really like these two chapters because they convey something that I think is really important to remember. Basically, prisons were still really new. The men who ran them knew very little about managing prisons. And there were a lot of practical questions that came up that no one knew the answers to. This situation created a lot of anxiety, pretty much for everyone interested in the new prisons. But it was especially heightened at Eastern because it was basically a one of a kind prison and because it was so heavily criticized. If anything went wrong, it seemed to confirm everyone's worst fears. The fifth and sixth chapters are also thematic but they look at how these administrators then publicly defended the prison and themselves against this criticism. These chapters also draw more heavily on sociological and criminological theory, diving into the way that the prison administrators experienced their own deviance. Then the seventh and eighth chapters look behind the scenes at what was really happening. I also really like these chapters because this is where you really get a sense of what life was like for the prison administrators, the staff, and at least some of the people incarcerated at Eastern. So chapter seven discusses the way in which prison administrators tweaked or violated the Pennsylvania system, for example, by confining two prisoners in the same cell to avoid further mental health deterioration among the prisoners, or by having some prisoners work outside of their cells where they were able to have unauthorized contact, such as with construction workers, delivery men, or even other prisoners, which ostensibly was a big no-no. Chapter eight then focuses on the more personal relationships between and among Eastern's administrators, focusing on some of the more colorful characters. In doing so, we see how these men sometimes put their own self-interest ahead of the prison that they worked so hard to defend, sometimes jeopardizing its functioning with their own selfishness. So this chapter is much more story-based than the others, and you can really get a sense of how some administrators behaved and changed over time. I sometimes refer to this as the drama chapter. The final two chapters return to a more historical narrative, while still focusing somewhat thematically on important topics. Chapter 9 looks at how Eastern's administrators started to see themselves as professionals or experts in the field of penology and penal science. In this chapter, we see how that claim to expertise eventually became more important than their earlier claims that they ran the world's best prison. And Chapter 10 traces a process by which the Pennsylvania system started to crumble. Basically, all the attention the administrators had been receiving for running a deviant prison started to go away as penal commentators became more interested in other developments. This led the administrators to focus instead on building up their professional profile 
while pressures inside the prison were making it more difficult to keep the Pennsylvania system intact. Finally, the book closes in 1913 with the formal end of the, of the Pennsylvania system and with Eastern finally conforming to national norms. So what do we learn from Eastern today in 2021, more than a century after the Pennsylvania system officially came to an end? I think there are three major lessons. First, Eastern's administrators were complex and complicated men, and I think that's often true of people in general. Too often, our descriptions of people who administer highly criticized criminal justice policies or practices are very one-dimensional. There are three types of accounts we give. We have the progressive do-gooders who truly believe in what they're doing, and that's why they're doing what they do. We have the rational managerial types who are very calculating and let cost-benefit analyses shape their views, or they simply try to do the most basic administrative functions to the exclusion of more high-minded goals. And finally, we have the bad actors, the people who are basically evil. What I found in doing my research on Eastern was its administrators were a little of all of these. Even the seemingly worst administrators, the ones who embezzled from the prison and tortured prisoners, really seemed to believe that what they were doing was right and good. And they engaged in a lot of other behavior that was pretty beneficial to incarcerated people. And they were very pragmatic about running the prison as efficiently as possible. This seemed incredibly contradictory to me. In order to explain the very puzzling behavior, I found I had to take seriously that they weren't just evil or just strategic or just true believers, but really that they had all three characters and more. When thinking about criminal justice today, it's sometimes tempting to attribute particular motivations to people, but I think we're never really going to be able to understand certain undesirable behaviors or to change those behaviors if we don't address the range of reasons driving them and instead we only focus on one specific driver. Second, the book illustrates, I hope, the importance of the various legacies of failure for penal reforms. And again, this continues today. What I mean is, in each reform effort that we see in the book, and that we've seen in the nearly two centuries since Eastern opened, penal reformers, politicians, penal administrators, and voters have been haunted by past failures. There have been so many times where people had really high hopes for new penal reforms, but then those reforms fail. It's that failure that shapes subsequent ideas about what to do next. So for example, the very first experiment with long-term solitary confinement happened in New York before Eastern State Penitentiary opened. It went terribly wrong with people dying and suffering both mentally and physically. The memory of that failure shaped future efforts with solitary confinement and helped to create the prison system we have today, as well as heightening the scrutiny that Eastern was under. The importance, uh, sorry, the importance of this legacy of failure has become really clear today as many activists call for abolition instead of further reforms because of the recognition that so many past reforms haven't worked the way they were supposed to. Third, the book helps us to think about how our ideas about penal policy are contingent, structured, even manipulated, and based more in simplistic understandings and bias than in solid evidence. For example, one of the things I found really interesting when working on the book was realizing that many of the critiques of the Pennsylvania system could equally be leveled at the Auburn system. So the Auburn system relied on factory style labor during the day and solitary confinement at night. Additionally, prisoners were whipped if they didn't work hard enough. But while the Auburn system relied on solitary confinement, only the Pennsylvania system's use of solitary confinement came under scrutiny. And people are willing to overlook the Auburn system's use of the whip as a regular disciplinary device. Likewise, people believe the Auburn system cost less and was potentially profitable because of its reliance on factory style labor, whereas the Eastern system used the, or sorry, the Eastern Pennsylvania system used craft style labor and because Eastern was comparatively expensive to build. But it turns out that very few Auburn style prisons turned a profit. And most of the profits they did get uh, from the more efficient type of labor went to the entrepreneurs who ran the prisons rather than to the state. These sorts of misconceptions about the different styles of incarceration, which both had major problems, were mostly generated because of the efforts of penal reformers, prison administrators, and politicians who promoted these myths about the two styles of incarceration. Likewise, today, there are a lot of myths about what works and what doesn't when it comes to crime control, incarceration, and policing. We all need to think critically about the messages we hear. We shouldn't simply accept something as better on some dimension because it's really popular or because it's the law or the practice that we currently have. 
There's one final point that I want to close with. I think that one of the most striking things that people might find in the book is just how different Eastern and the Pennsylvania system were from how we do things today. So for example, whereas the Pennsylvania system was designed to maintain prisoners' privacy so that they could re-enter society without being stigmatized by their criminal record, today we have mugshots in local newspapers, background check software, and public databases of people who have been registered as sex offenders. Or whereas Eastern used solitary confinement both for that privacy purpose as well as to help prisoners become rehabilitated during their incarceration. Today, rehabilitation is a heavily contested idea, and we mostly use solitary confinement as a form of punishment or incapacitation for people. I think it's worth reflecting on how much things have changed. And while the punishments we use, the prisons we use, are so different today. In doing so, I think it's really helpful to remember that there's no reason we had to go this route, and that there always have been other pathways, but we chose this one. If ever there was a time to spend more time thinking about our history, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. That's so great. Um, uh, while you have the picture up on the screen, do you just want to tell us a little bit? This is the, the illustration that's on the book cover, right? So do you want to say something about that? Sure. Yeah. So this is actually, um, it's a very similar version. Um, this is what the prison looked like um, in uh, in about 1913 um, and in the, the decades to follow. It's basically what it looked like when it closed in 1970, um, although this little figurine is from uh, about 1913. So, um, Basically, uh, so Eastern has this very famous architectural design called the radial model where the, the uh, cell blocks are kind of um, going off in kind of like a spoke, like uh, like a wheel, like spokes on a wheel. Um, and what you see in this picture actually is how it got filled in over time, how basically the uh, original plan got um, pushed to the side as overcrowding happened. So you see all these additional cell blocks kind of filling in the gaps where there used to be space, um, like open yards and gardens and um like little ponds and things like that. Um, and so it just got filled in and eventually, um, it's not seen in this picture, but eventually you get um, like a, a, an Auburn style cell block added in. Um, and so you see the kind of the physical landscape of the prison um, of Eastern changes um, over time as the Pennsylvania system increasingly goes away. Yeah, it's an incredible illustration. And I love the last image you had on the screen, which is the photograph of the prisoner in the cell. And I assume that's just a typical cell. That's what one of the solitary confinement cells looked like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the historical context into which Eastern um, emerged? Because prisons didn't always exist, right? So when did they arrive on the scene and, and why? Yeah, thank you. So, um, so prisons are really new, which is something that's kind of um, sometimes hard to wrap our minds around considering how widespread they are today and how much we, we rely on them. So prisons came about basically um, in the United States after the American uh, Revolution. Uh, before that, our primary form of punishment was capital and corporal punishment. Um, so like people would be branded or whipped um, as part of their punishment or they would have to be publicly shamed in what was called the pillory or the stocks. Um, and what we had, what people think of as, as prisons and what were called prisons at the time were actually what we would call jails. Um, so basically people weren't held in confinement for punishment. They were held in confinement until their trial came up or until they were executed. Or in some cases there were witnesses who were held over until their trial started. Um, so we didn't have places of punishment that used confinement, um, but just these kind of administrative holding tanks basically. So um, after the American uh, Revolution, um, for a variety of reasons, people start to kind of dislike this, this approach of using capital and corporal punishments. And they also get, um, they, they start to see the, the jails that we're using as highly problematic because they're heavily overcrowded, they're not well regulated, um, they're disease infested, they, they tend to spread a lot of disease, um, something that's coming up again today. Um, and so they wanted to reform these places. And out of this kind of disgust with their current system of punishment and with this horrible jail facility that we, we used, um, out of this comes the first generation of prisons starting in 1785 and going on through the 1810s and early 1820s. And then once those prisons start to kind of dramatically fail, they, the prisoners start setting fires, they start having mass escape, uh, they start having prison riots. 
um, just across the board, they're not doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, that's when people start calling for these second generation prisons that are going to be bigger, stronger, and more tightly controlled. And that's where we get Eastern and the Auburn system. Um, and so, so once this, this new model of long-term confinement um, came into existence, was it, you know, was it immediately accepted? Was it controversial? Yeah, I would say um, it depends on uh, which groups you're thinking about. I would say when it comes to penal reformers, um, they were pretty much sold on incarceration. Um, so especially the, um, a lot of penal reformers, uh, you can think of like kind of um, volunteers, middle and upper class people, mostly white men. Um, there are very few women involved at this time. Um, so basically the kind of upper crust of society, um, they were very much in favor of incarceration. Um, and the big question was just what what is that incarceration gonna look like? Um, politicians were kind of mixed. There were a lot that were in favor of it, but some that were kind of wondering, you know, should we go back to corporal punishment? Should we expand our use of capital punishment? Um, so as today, you know, people had different political views and different reasons for uh, different sets of morality, different reasons for preferring one thing or another. So politicians were kind of mixed. Um, there is some research on how um, the types of people who would end up going to prison um, that would be most disproportionately represented in prisons, especially people from the lower classes, uh, tended to be more opposed to, um, to incarceration. Um, and there's a lot of good research on this, especially in England. Um, I saw less of this in, in my research just because of the types of, of sources I was using. Um, but there was a kind of more, uh, more resistance from, um, from like working class people than from the, the kind of upper class who saw themselves as um, kind of these progressive do-gooders who were gonna you know, fix, uh, fix crime, fix society, save the Republic and all that. So, yeah. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna ask a couple of these questions that are coming in from the audience interspersed with my questions. Um, so the first one is, first of all, it says great talk. Can you say something about the importance of Charles Dickens' critique of Eastern in his book, American Notes, and why it caused such a stir at the time and continues to reverberate? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, it's funny because I, when I was writing the book, I didn't want to use the Dickens quotes because it's, it's, it's one that keeps coming up and it, like it, it's in every work of Eastern. I thought like, okay, there's, you know, I, I don't really want to do that because everybody else has done it, but it turns out to be so important that I couldn't. Um, so it's important on a number of dimensions. So Charles Dickens comes to the United States for a tour um, and by, and he's like going around and touring the, the major um, kind of tourist attractions and states and in, in, um, in, in this country. And by the time he gets to Pennsylvania, he hates Americans. He's just disgusted by <laughs> what he sees as these like backwards country bumpkins. Um, and so he's just absolutely disgusted with like our manners and all of this stuff. Um, but he really wants to see Eastern because like he's written about jails and debtors prisons. His father had been incarcerated. Um, you know, he's especially like a fan of the downtrodden who of course is overrepresented in prisons. Um, and so he wants to see Eastern. And Eastern at this point is also a tourist attraction. So a lot of people have come to visit it. So he gets special attention to uh, go through and even interview some of the prisoners. This happened a lot with like celebrities and high level politicians. They could come in and kind of get the behind the scenes tour um, of prisons. Um, and so he comes in and he visits Eastern. And from all accounts of the administrators, he's very polite. He's very impressed. He, um, he tells them that your prison in Niagara Falls are the two scenes I most wanted to see in my, in my visit. And so everything seems great. And then his book comes out and he slams Eastern as this torturous place that it's the, um, like the treatment that the prisoners are receiving, how sad they seem, how they're mentally and physically deteriorating, how everything is going badly for them. And it's just this in unimaginable torture that they're in, enacting on these prisoners. And he says at one point even that the administrators, these benevolent men, know not what it is that they're doing, which really cuts them. Um, and so they, like this was really, um, you know, like on a, a public scale, like other people are reading this, like this gets requoted in a number of other um, uh, pamphlets and nationally circulated um, kind of periodicals and things. But the kind of behind the scenes reaction is is pretty stark. The the wardens and the the board of inspectors who run the prison, they really don't like this. Like in in their own private documents, they're talking about how you know. But he was so like he seemed impressed. Like this is really shocking that he would say this. 
and everything that he said was wrong. Like he attributed this one person as being like deaf, but actually he had a head cold that week. He wasn't actually deaf and like all these things, just like trying to nitpick on, on all of these things. But like 30 years after this Dickens visit, um, the, the warden of the prison is, who wasn't even part of the prison at the time is still reflecting on that visit and how like, uh, and he's still talking about prisoners who had like been incarcerated at the time. And he was, you know, just going on about how Dickens like was totally unfair to them. So I'm um, kind of stepping back a little bit. Dickens is just part of this broader criticism that Easton received. Um, there were very few fans of the Pennsylvania system and most of them were local. And even they kind of would criticize it from time to time. So um, basically Dickens had the profile to like really convey that criticism broadly. Um, but he was one of a number of people who are criticizing the prison for its um, its torture um, of the prisoners by keeping them in, in this long-term solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. um, that's so that's so interesting. Um, and so wait, here's another audience question. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about some of the motives of the administration. There seems to be some tensions between prisons making money and prisons morally reforming inmates? Yeah, great question. Um, so there are kind of two levels at which this is happening. So I would say for most prisons in the United States at the time, um, this is a huge issue. And Rebecca McLennan's book, The Crisis of Imprisonment, which is also a Cambridge University Press book, um, delves into this uh, extensively. And it's a really important question because she shows how prison labor is so important to incarceration and kind of shapes every aspect of policy and practice um, pretty much like into the 1870s and it kind of changes a little bit. Um, but especially in the period I'm focusing on, um, this is really important for other prisons. So these other prisons are run by um, contractors, like entrepreneurs who lease out the prison basically from the state and they pocket the, the profits. But not many people at the time or even now understood that process and so they thought that this was a way for um, basically states to um, not have to use tax revenue to pay for the prisons, which was a major concern at the time. So, um, and, and as it is you know, today, because prisons were and always have been extremely expensive to maintain. So this idea that prisoners could kind of pay for their upkeep and pay for the costs of maintaining the prison was really attractive. And it had been with us since the very first prisons. Um, all of the prisons we started with included labor of some kind um, in, their, in their design. Um, when it comes to Eastern, because they're doing this kind of different type of, of labor, um, officially this craft style labor was supposed to be not about, re or sorry, was not supposed to be about cost um, benefits, although they did talk about how it would help with the upkeep. So kind of still buying into that idea that it would reduce costs, but not necessarily profit. Um, but what they were really interested in was that they, they would be giving prisoners skills so that when they would re-enter society, they could kind of move up in the social hierarchy. They wouldn't necessarily be employed or be um, kind of limited to seasonal labor, but instead they would have some sort of solid way of, of supporting themselves and potentially their families um, once they're done. Uh, so the, basically that their incarceration would be beneficial um, for this kind of rehabilitative and what we now call re-entry purposes. Um, in practice is where you really start to see the tension. So because the Eastern was so heavily criticized for what was seen as an expensive and unprofitable approach because craft style labor is less efficient because the prison is so big and expensive to build and maintain, um, there was a lot of uh, kind of behind the scenes cost cutting. And so a lot of times um, they would think about like, well, having um, teaching this prisoner who is an unskilled laborer, some sort of skilled labor, is going to be too cost um, uh, cost prohibitive, um, and especially if they're only in there for say like a year or two years. And they decided the administrators decided that um, basically if prisoners were in for one or two years, that instead of teaching them a new skill, which would be too expensive, they would just give them more unskilled labor. So one of my favorite examples of this is what's called bobbin winding. So basically, you have this like long stick that you would wind yarn around, and that was just the assignment that they were given. This was not considered skilled labor. Skilled labor. Um, it was not something that was going to help them get a job afterwards and be like an independent craftsperson, but it was one of the kind of um, tweaks that they made, um, kind of giving into this criticism and trying to um, avoid reifying the critiques of the prison system instead of going what they going with what they were supposed to be doing, which is giving people skilled labor and helping them kind of set up for a better life when they're out of prison. Um, so the next question actually from the audience dovetails with some questions that I had. Can you say something about the kinds of people 
demographics of Eastern inmates over time and or about the kinds of crime, if any, that the Pennsylvania system focused on. Any significant differences between the Auburn and Pennsylvania systems in terms of their inmates and crimes? Yeah, great question. So basically all prisons at this time um, tended to go for a standard um, distinction that we still use and that we um, kind of took from the English system. So we tend to distinguish between misdemeanors, which are supposed to be kind of low level offenses um, and felonies, which are supposed to be serious crimes. So all state prisons are generally um, set up for felonies. And one of the big distinctions between felonies and misdemeanors is by state law in the penal code, felonies are typically gonna be punished with at least one year in, um, in confinement uh, or more. Um, whereas misdemeanors are supposed to be uh, punished for less than a year. So this is one of the few um, uses of uh, penal kind of punishment purposes of jails. So if you get sentenced say to three months um, incarceration, you would go to jail instead of prison. And that's generally true today as well as at the time with some exceptions. Um, so basically, uh, Eastern and the Auburn system prisons all kind of use that 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 approach. They were all kind of felony based um, uh, state prisons um, with people who would be sentenced um, typically to one year or more, um, sometimes 10, 15, sometimes longer. Um, one big difference with the Auburn style prisons is they tended to have longer sentences, whereas um, Eastern tended or Pennsylvania generally tended to have shorter sentences in part because they saw their prison system as more extreme and so you didn't need to confine people for as long. Um, in terms of the, the demographics then from people, um, I would say uh, in terms of their socioeconomic status, um, people were massively overrepresented from um, kind of the poor um, groups in society. So like the lower class, the working class, um, people who are not, um, there were some craftspeople um, and some people kind of at that um, kind of lower middle class um, standing but there are very few, for example, lawyers or businessmen, um, people who are like more well-established, that, that didn't tend to happen. Um, there were some, but like vast majority were um, poorer people. Um, it also overrepresented uh, immigrants to the, United, to the United States, and it also massively overrepresented African-American people. So throughout the, um, the main period that I'm looking at, uh, basically, 1829 to the 1870s, um, there were about, uh, for that entire period, there were about 25% of the prison population was African American. Um, and at the time, the African American population of Philadelphia, where Eastern is located, was 8%. Whereas some of the counties that people were sent from would be like 2% or even like less than 1% African American. So there's massive overrepresentation of black people being sent to prison. Um, similarly with um, immigration, but it kind of varied from group to group. So like the biggest groups um, that were reflected in the prison, to some extent matched the demographics of, um, of Eastern Pennsylvania. So uh, German, English, and, um, uh, and Irish were the, the big three um, kind of ethnic groups at the time um, who were uh, white immigrants. Um, in terms of how that differed from, uh, from New York, I think it was fairly similar. I don't have the, um, the statistics off the top of my head, but I know that basically across the North, black people were overrepresented in, in prisons and immigrants were overrepresented in prisons, but the demographics varied a little bit from state to state, depending on um, kind of if you had a major like port or something. Um, and how close you were to the southern border and, and those sorts of issues. Um, one other group that's sometimes not thought about is women. Um, so women were underrepresented in prison, but they were in the prison. So Eastern had about 5% of its prison population uh, were women um, throughout the period that I'm looking at. It's not until well after the Civil War that we start getting um, more prisons that are specifically for women. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that um, basically people came from a range of ages. Uh, I think the youngest prisoner that I came across was like 12, but it might even be younger than that. I don't remember. Um, but basically children would be sent to Eastern. Additionally, there were some um, children of incarcerated people who would sometimes stay, especially with their mothers, um, in, in the prison under the idea that separating children would be, um, would be worse than, um, than having them in prison. And that would be also you know, good for the women as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the range of the, um, the demographics of people who are in prison. Um, going back to the crimes for a minute, um, so in addition to like the types of crimes that we'd have today, uh, with the exclusion of drugs, we, we didn't really have a lot of drug offenses back then, but look, we have like the big, um, big serious crimes like murder, manslaughter, robbery, burglary, rape, uh, arson, um, and those sorts of crimes. 
there were a couple of crimes that we don't have so much today. Uh, so like one of my favorite was horse theft. Um, there were also a number of like male related offenses like stealing from the mail. Um, we also had some embezzling, um, forgery, uh, and things like that. So it's just like a pretty big range of property offenses, violent offenses, um, not so many morals offenses at this point, um, but that was kind of the, the range of, of crimes that came up. And are there any records of the prisoners' experiences you know, in, in their own voices or any documents that relate those experiences? Yeah, there are a few. Um, one of my favorite collections is a series of letters between two, um, two incarcerated people during the Civil War, um, a young woman and a young man. Um, I think she was 18 and he was 21. Um, and they met in prison uh, in, during their out-of-cell work assignments um, and were able to communicate with each other. And they wrote each other these florid love letters. Um, and they, they would kind of talk about how they wanted to see each other, how they wanted to be free. Um, it also expressed some of um, the woman's anxiety about what would happen because the man was going to get out of prison before her and she didn't um, she didn't trust that he was going to be faithful to her. And so she kind of would try to test him to see um, if he was going to be faithful. So she like made up um, another prisoner who was supposed to be very beautiful, beautiful um, and was interested in him to see if he would like take the bait sort of thing. So um, so it was just like, you know, basic human beings living their lives behind bars to the, to the extent that they could. Um, uh, there were some other letters um, that I looked at as well, but uh, most of the letters we have come from later years after the Pennsylvania system is open, um, in part because prisoners, um, at least until about the uh, sorry, 1870s, weren't allowed to communicate with their families. They weren't allowed to receive visits or exchange letters. So we don't have that. We do have some accounts of people who um, either published accounts of their incarceration after they, um, after they were released, or they also would write letters to um, to the prison administrators, or sometimes they would come back and visit. Um, so sometimes we have like their behavior um, is also an, a, uh, an indicator of things. So a number of people actually came back to the prison to be reincarcerated voluntarily because they couldn't find work after they had been released. And so they would negotiate with the warden to continue to get their prison rations and to con continue to do their prison work um, while they would basically like save up money uh, before they would go out into the world again. So that's, um, you know, it's not in their own words, but at least we have that that documented um, actions that they took. Um, we also have some letters that were reproduced in the public reports from the prison, um, but I'm less trustworthy of those documents because they don't quite match the tone and the writing style of the, the letters that I know were written by prisoners, for sure. Um, and so I think they were kind of improved, shall we say, by the prison administrators and penal reformers. Um, so we have to kind of be careful about how we read into those. So, um, so yeah, those are, those are kind of the range of sources, um, as is so often the case, people at the lower end of the hierarchy and who are more vulnerable in society don't leave as many documents behind and also, um, in part because a lot of people were illiterate at the time, um, although one of the things they would learn in prison was often how to write, but also um, people weren't as invested in uh, maintaining the documents that they produced as they were the people who were in the higher levels of society. Um, okay, we have another question from the audience. Dr. Rubin spoke a fair bit about how penal actors were important for the unique arc the Eastern model took. I'm wondering what place, if any, larger political actors rather than penal actors may have played in this process. Yeah, great question. So I actually thought that the legislatures and governors and even the courts would be more important. Um, so the, um, to some extent, the low-level courts were important in, um, in one sense, which is they controlled who went to Eastern. And, um, but ultimately, it was up to the administrators to accept people. And especially in the early years, they would sometimes turn prisoners away and say, we don't have the jurisdiction to confine this person. But then there would be like a back and forth and they would decide like, well, the only other place for this person is, you know, like this place or something. So we don't want to send them there. So we'll go ahead and accept them, even though we don't actually have the authority to accept them. Um, so there was kind of a tension between whom the judges would send or sentence to um, Eastern state and what was actually in the law. They didn't always follow the law. Um, they had also sometimes sentenced people to less than one year, which was also against the law. So that's judges um, at the, the lower court level. Um, I really thought legislators would pay, play a bigger role because, you know, officially legislators authorized the Pennsylvania system. They deauthorized the Pennsylvania system. They controlled the amount of resources that Eastern received from the state. 
um, and they could also kind of control um, various other aspects of the prison. Um, but for the most part, the legislature wasn't really that interested in what was going on at Eastern. Um, they had other things that were just, I guess, more important that they cared about more. They hated the fact that Eastern was so expensive, so they kind of starved Eastern for resources. So that would sometimes make um, administration very difficult for the men who ran Eastern. Um, and then importantly, sometimes Eastern's administrators would just ignore the law. So at one point um, in 18, uh, 1860 to 1861, uh, there's kind of a kerfuffle uh, between the legislators and the administrators, where the legislators pass a law at the behest of the local penal reformers, and the administrators are incredibly insulted that the legislature didn't consult them to see about um, passing this law. And they say, look, this is a horrible law. It's, you know, it's First of all, it's badly written. Second of all, it's going to damage our prison. Um, you guys should have consulted us first. And by the way, we're just not going to implement this this law. The law was supposed to um, was a system to do early release for um, for incarcerated people, so that if they engaged in uh, like good behavior during their confinement, they could earn time off their sentence. And the administrators hated this idea. Um, so as you might expect, prisoners then sued. Um, they filed a habeas corpus case uh, that went up to the state supreme court. Um, and the state Supreme Court sided with the legislatures and said, they're right, you legislate, or sorry, with the administrators, you legislators, you should have consulted these experts, which is something they'd been working on um, to claim their expertise. You should have consulted them first because clearly you don't know what you're doing. We have a fantastic prison here and a fantastic Pennsylvania system. And you're trying to mess with something that's been working and that's getting us worldwide renown, which, you know, they weren't, but that's what the administrators had told them. Um, so the the law was overturned. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the um, the legislature rewrote the law, did it again. And this time the administrators didn't fight them because now they're facing overcrowding. So they went along with it. Um, the other thing to know about the legislature is they basically only acted when the local penal reformers told them to. So the penal reformers become a really important player too but they also kind of have a limited impact because ultimately the administrators controlled what happened behind the scenes. They controlled penal reformers access. They sometimes did some kind of shady things like hiding certain prisoners from the penal reformers so they couldn't tell them about like certain bad behaviors happening. Um, so that's, that's the legislature and the penal reformers. And finally, the governor. Um, a number of times throughout this, this history, you would see the governor kind of responding to um, calls from penal reformers or like national conversations. And, um, and the governor would kind of say something in his speeches. Um, it was always a male governor at the time. Um, so he would say something in his speeches about prisons. Um, and so sometimes the, uh, the legislature would respond to that, but mostly it would take um, a number of years before, like a number of proddings before they actually did anything. Um, so that's kind of the role for these higher level administrators. Um, there was just, um, oh, one other thing I forgot is after the American Civil War, um, the legislature, at the behest of the penal reformers, uh, creates what they call a board of charities and correction, which is kind of the predecessor to the Department of Corrections or the Department of Public Safety that we have today. Um, and that starts to kind of oversee the prison a little bit more, but it's still, as far as I could tell, very kind of hands off in the period I'm looking at. Um, so it's it's like the beginnings of a prison bureaucracy, but with very little oversight in practice. So for the most part, it really comes down to the prison administrators. Um, so uh, the next question is, uh, it's really about specifically about sort of solitary confinement and the meanings of sort of solitary confinement then and now. It says, do you think that solitary confinement feels differently to the men and women subjected to it today because it's stripped of any reformative rationale? Yeah, I think what we use today definitely is experience. Like, I think there's, there are going to be some parallels because regardless of what else is in there, solitary is solitary. And even if you have these frills that, that Eastern had, so prisoners that Eastern had access to a little um, yard next to their cell, a private yard that they could go into, they had a skylight so they could see the sky and like actually experience you know, the weather. Um, they had a fairly large cell. They had reading materials. They had um, you know visits from the staff and the penal reformers. So they had all these other things. Plus they had work and plus they would um, kind of hear sermons on Sunday and they would get um, education, like one-on-one -on -one education and stuff. So all of that. And yet people still had mental and physical health problems because, you know, putting human beings in boxes, even with all those frills to help, is still very, very bad. In fact, putting people in boxes, even without solitary confinement, is also very bad on people's um, kind of mental and physical health. Um, 
But today, yeah, it's definitely even more stripped down. Um, it varies a lot. There, um, like the what we use as solitary confinement today, especially in, in supermax prisons, um, there's a lot of variation. But for the most part, it tends to be very stripped down. Um, there are some where you can uh, the prisoners can talk to other prisoners, like through the cell door. There are others where you can't even hear anything. Sometimes it's very loud. Sometimes it's very quiet. Um, so there's a lot of variation. But I think overall, like, you know, they don't get visits as much. Um, they're not getting kind of like friendly contact with staff in a lot of cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases, um, I think people are having um, even greater rates of mental um, kind of decompensation um, and self-harm and things like that than they did at the time. Um, at the same time, there are also people, there's research of people who prefer to be in solitary confinement, which, you know, some people actually do well in solitary confinement, but we also know that there are a lot of health problems that affect most people who go into solitary confinement. And of course, we're also keeping people in solitary for far longer um, than we did um, at the time. So there are people who've been in solitary confinement for decades, whereas at Eastern, I think one of the longer ones was like 15 or 20 years. Um, and that was pretty extreme. That was really rare. Most people were in prison for less than 10 years. Um, whereas, you know, today people can be in there for years and decades. So, you know, so that that's a, a, one of the questions I had um, was, you know, so what, what what were their sort of stated goals at the, at this time with this Eastern model? Was it to uh, to punish, to to re to rehabilitate? Were were they were they talking about humane treatment at the time? You know what what were what were their goals in in doing this in putting forth this model? Yeah, great question. So um so basically prisons at the time were considered a humane and enlightened innovation. Um, they were actually seen as like a symbol of how progressive Americans were and how they were kind of leading the way and making the world a better place. Like first with democracy, now with our more kind of democratically appropriate punishments because most of the rest of the world at this time, or at least the rest of the world that we're coming into, con into contact with are still using capital and corporal punishment. And they're starting to also implement incarceration, mostly looking at the examples that we have, as well as some of the early examples in England and other countries that were kind of like more primitive versions of, of these prisons. So we're all kind of having this big conversation about prisons. And one of the main goals is to make prisons humane because in, or sorry, capital punishment was seen as so inhumane and so unenlightened and irrational. And so incarceration in the prison was supposed to be rational and humane and enlightened um, and progressive. And so this was like a main um, claim to be like better than everybody else, essentially. Um, in terms of the specific goals, um, yeah, so they, they basically saw rehabilitation and deterrence as their primary goals. And I would say more on rehabilitation than, than deterrence. Um, but deterrence was also there. It's just all you had to do basically is put somebody in prison for a certain period of time and ensure that the, um, the sanction was fairly certainly used. So, for example, pardons uh, kind of interfered with the deterrence rationale because if you thought, oh, I'll just get my friends to write, a, write to the governor and have him pardon me, you know, after a few weeks of incarceration, then I don't have to worry about my three year sentence. Um, so that was kind of the way that deterrence really came up. Um, but in this case, uh, rehabilitation was was much more important. So the goals were basically to get somebody away from what they saw as a bad environment. So they believed that crime was caused by negative influences. You know, maybe your friends kind of get you on the wrong track or you have like a bad upbringing or maybe you ran away or um, you had uh, an apprenticeship that didn't go so well. So you ran away from your apprenticeship. Uh, so something went wrong early on or you grew up in a family with a lot of alcoholism or something like that or your your friends got you into alcohol. So, you know, something about your environment is causing you to commit crime. So first thing we're going to do is pull you out of that environment and put you into a clean and friendly environment with good moral influences, at least, you know, as, as they saw them. Um, and so they would have this moral instructor, kind of like a minister, come and talk to the prisoner on a I would say like a weekly or bi-weekly basis, um, as well as give the sermons. Um, the staff would come in and teach them how to work so that if they didn't know how to how to work, they could get a job afterwards, uh, a better paying job anyway. Um, they would get kind of mentorship from the warden and from the board of inspectors and from the penal reformers. And so this whole process of kind of removing the negative influences and giving them positive influences would make them a better person um, to use the phrase that they they used a lot of, um, at the time, especially in the earlier years, they would make them into industrious, virtuous, and useful uh, citizens. And so that was the goal, basically, um, 
These were these Republican machines that were supposed to uh, make good citizens who would then go on and help protect the democracy and, and the, the new republic. Um, and so that was kind of the, the main point um, of this. And in the process to not injure the prisoners, to be as beneficial to them as possible, to reduce crime so it's beneficial to society in general, and as much as possible to try to do this while saving saving money, like cutting costs to the extent that that was possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so just being humane and, and cost effective, which of course are kind of two sometimes contradictory um, goals. So, yeah. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions, which I think we can squeeze in here. Um, one is, um, can you say a little bit about the methods and sources that you used while writing this book? Yeah. Thank you. I'd love to. <laughs> um, so I used a lot of archival documents, some of which are online and some I went to archive. So I visited um, the American Philosophical Society and the Historical Society of Philadelphia, which are both located in the city of Philadelphia. Um, one of those, the American Philosophical Society, is actually pretty much across the street from where the first uh, Philadelphia prison, um, Walnut Street Jail or Walnut Street Prison was. So that was really cool to be doing my research like in that space. Um, and then I also went to um, the historical state or the state archives of Pennsylvania um, for some other archives. Um, and so those were my three main archives. And then there are a number of other documents available online in various databases. Um, I, in terms of, of those documents, I used things at the kind of prison level the local Philadelphia level, the state level, uh, the national level, and the international level. So I was looking at um, at the kind of international and national level penal reformer documents that were usually pamphlets or sometimes published letters. Uh, they would also have annual reports for um, penal reform societies. So there's the Boston uh, Prison Discipline Society, there's the New York um, Prison Association, the uh, Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons, uh, which was later renamed to a shorter title um, and still exists today as the Pennsylvania Prison Society. Um, and so they would have these like annual reports or journals that they would put out um, kind of talking about prisons and, um, and penal ideas basically. Um, there'd be these exchanges sometimes between um, people across from like England and, and, uh, and the United States. Sometimes people would um, publish their travel logs, so just like Charles Dickens did. Um, sometimes politicians or um, expats from other countries uh, during the American, um, uh, or sorry, during the French Revolution, people came over uh, from France and kind of just set up camp in, in the United States. And so they would visit. So I read some um, early visits uh, to Walnut Street uh, Jail and later prison that would be describing like what was going on there. Um, so a lot of penal reform literature. Um, there were also some periodicals that were kind of um, literary magazines that also would discuss penal um, things. So the North American Review, for example, was a great periodical that was um, in the existence throughout the period I'm looking at. And they would often kind of review um, new penal documents, like new penal reform pamphlets or the, uh, a series of annual reports from the different um, uh, penal reform societies or from the prisons themselves. Um, I should also mention that the prison's annual reports would also sometimes be published in newspapers, so that was another way to get at those. Um, at the prison level, I was looking at both public and private documents. So um, the public documents were things like their annual reports, which um, in the early years could be a couple of dozen pages, and by the end it could be several hundred pages. Um, there were some that were like 300 pages or so. And these consisted of official reports from the warden, the physician, the moral instructor, and the board of inspectors. Um, and so they would kind of go over like what happened that year, what they thought. They would sometimes explain things like why their um, their uh, insanity rate or their disease rate, uh, as they measured it anyway, was high, or why their um, expenses seemed to be too high that year. Or you know, they would say like, "Hey, this year we almost turned a profit." Um, and so they would kind of like give an account of the prison, and then they would also make recommendations to the legislature, like you know, pass a law that extends people's prison sentences or pass a law that shrinks people's prison sentences or, you know, you should really be talking to the, the local courts and the judges and telling them, you know, not to be sentencing people, excuse me, people in this particular way or, you know, more needs to be done to care about the youth in our in our city because we're seeing a lot of kids coming into Eastern these days and, you know, like we need to invest in like more apprenticeship programs or something. So there's just a whole bunch of different thoughts that they would have. Um, in terms of the private records at, at Eastern, um, I would also look at the warden's uh, daily log, which was kind of like, it wasn't exactly a diary, it wasn't it, like a log is really accurate. It was this journal that they would keep um, documenting everything from like the weather that day, 
to events that happened. Like one time there was a gas leak, and so they documented what happened with the gas leak. They would um, document the arrival and dismissal of various prisoners. Um, they would talk about the hiring and firing and disciplining of staff. Sometimes they would record um, the uh, the punishment of, of the prisoners. Um, they would also talk about things that they would do when um, to help people be released from the prison. Uh, so like getting somebody a job or giving them clothing so that they wouldn't look like they wouldn't be wearing rag ragged clothes because um, the clothes that they had come in with from 10 years ago had like been moth eaten or something. So they would give them new clothes. Uh, so they would document those sorts of things. And then um, sometimes they're like personal reactions about stuff like, you know, so and so came to the prison and they weren't invited, but we had to see them anyway because, you know, they're a member of the legislature or something. And really, they just wanted to have a party for their family in the prison. And, you know, this was totally unacceptable. So things like that would happen. Um, let's see. I, there are a number of other private documents that I looked at, like um, records of labor, um, uh, the board of inspectors meeting minutes that I looked at. I also looked at the um, uh, Penal Reform Society's meeting minutes. Uh, that was a really useful resource because they would document stuff that um, that wouldn't necessarily show up in some of the other records. There was also a diary of a penal reformer who would um, explain various things. Uh, like he would say, you know, I saw prisoners out of their cell today, or I saw two prisoners in a cell, or I had this conversation with this prisoner, or this staff member told me this bit of gossip and things. Um, and so that was a, another helpful kind of um, source of somebody who is not who is differently invested in the prison than the administrators. Um, I also paid attention to um, a lot of laws passed nationwide as well as in Pennsylvania, um, as well as governor's speeches. Um, and in some cases, some um, discussions in the, the state legislature and of course court cases. So a lot of different um, primary sources um, went into this, this project. Okay, so we have two more minutes and two questions. So these answers have to be pretty concise. And the questions are, um, given the socioeconomic level of those imprisoned, do you think some of them may have actually improved their quality and standard of living by being in prison? I'm going to give you both questions. And were executions ever carried out at Eastern? Great questions. Uh, the second one I can answer quickly. Um, yes, they were, uh, not during the period that I was looking at. Um, so there, uh, there, there's an execution um, kind of uh, chamber or building, um, a death house, I think they called it. Um, so if you go to Eastern today, which is a, a, a tourist facility, you can actually see the death house at Eastern. Um, in the period I'm looking at, I don't think they had any executions, or at least it wasn't in the records. Um, I think they, they carried them out afterwards. And for the most part, executions were fairly rare in Pennsylvania during this period. Um, for the first question, um, yes, I think so. I, and sadly, this is something that's still true today, that sometimes people are just because they're, they're so so under-resourced um, and not properly cared for like by society um, on the outside, that sometimes people are better off. And considering, like, especially today, how, how bad the quality of food is and how bad the quality of life is, that's really saying something about you know, how, how people are sometimes really um, worse off. At Eastern in the period I'm looking at, though, like people got pretty nutritious food, um, pretty well-rounded diets. Um, they you know, like they had, you know, clean clothing. They had a fairly large cell. Um, according to contemporary records, a lot of these cells were actually bigger than um, than a lot of the um, places that people would live, like working class people would live um, in free society. Um, so there were a lot of um, kind of ways in which people were sometimes better off in prison, um, which is not just a statement of like, how Eastern was in many ways trying to be a humane prison, but also a statement of how badly off some people were and how they needed you know, more resources in free society. 